I have far less notes on this film than the previous two we've looked at, just as a heads up. <clears throat> that doesn't surprise me much, though. I'll explain why in a minute, because it, beca it comes up at a certain point in the film. But I do want to mention that I also have less behind-the-scenes notes, because the production on this film was actually surprisingly very smooth. It is worth noting that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 here probably has the least to do with everything else uh, so far. Now, they were specifically setting up pieces for the future, which will actually, as of me recording this, still come forward in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. And they did want to make sure several pieces, puzzle pieces, were specifically in place for Infinity War. The biggest and most important one being Nebula. Because her character arc is something that a lot of the creators like, both... Uh... Oh, God, I can't think of his name. Gunn. James Gunn. And... Uh... <laughs> And Kevin Feige have expressed a lot of interest in the Nebula character arc, and so it was pretty important to them to make sure that they started establishing her here. Because in the first film, she was just kind of another bad guy with a little bit of baggage. Here they wanted to really develop her into a character, and you know she does have a full arc in this film, which is good because that's going to carry forward into Infinity War. They didn't have Nicole Perlman writing for this one, which is a bit of a shame. She was busy, apparently. She's, uh, if you're wondering who the heck that is, she worked on the first film as a scriptwriter, as well as uh, Captain Marvel, and she recently did Detective Pikachu, which I know sounds like a joke, but actually it's a surprisingly good film. So doesn't surprise me that she worked on it. She, she does good stuff. I also have to m make special praise for the fact that they sat down and completely redesigned Rocket. Pretty much from the ground up. The model, if you want to call it that, in this film is a, is a totally new model than the previous one. And they can do a lot more with it expressively, and it shows. They also had issues getting a proper Sony Walkman and the actual Sony prop for the thing, because... Well, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> how many of you ever had a Sony Walkman? I did. Yeah, those things, those things were notoriously unreliable, even when they came out. Even when they were new, they were just bad and broke all the time. I actually replaced mine twice before I gave up on it and got a Philips micro recorder instead. Because it's... Oh. <laughs> so it's just funny to me that they're like, all right, we need this for the film. They ended up building their own from scratch because they had to. <laughs> Let's talk about the film. So this is set only a few months after one. Now that's important because this comes a few years, or I think just a year and a half, two years, something like that, after the first film. So in short, this is supposed to be set technically before Civil War, which if you're paying attention, Doctor Strange was technically set before Civil War as well. This is kind of the issue with the timeline problem here, but all of these films are still kind of occurring within the rel same relative space here. And we'll be leading up to, you know, when we start actually moving the plot forward a little bit. Which we're not, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, I also, I'm looking at this thing. This is, uh, how do you decide to do, to establish the Sovereign? Okay, I've got it. And we'll have a shot of all of the planets basically right next to each other and highly, highly cyberneticized. Now, that, I, I feel, I, that sounds like I'm being facetious, but I mean that sincerely. One of the things I've talked about many times in fiction is the idea of control over the environment. So first, you are at the mercy of your environment. And then you become to the point where you can endure the environment. Then you get to the point where you can survive the environment and then thrive in the environment and then destroy the environment and then control the environment. And that's the rough path of both technological and magical progression. It's based on our own real-life history. You know, for the longest time, we were completely at the mercy, and then and then we could damage the environment, and we aren't actually at the point of mastery yet. But true mastery over the environment is almost always a visual thing. It's down to the art design of a particular piece, and this is a good example of that. Given that we later find out that the Sovereign genetically engineer every single individual person to the point of ridiculousness, you could you could kind of see why they would have something like completely generated, constructed thing. Like, they probably took their system of, like, these planets are too far apart. <laughs> Let's just make new planets and new orbits. That'll destroy everything. Not if we have mastery over the environment. See? Now, it, the point here is that the mastery point requires ridiculous levels of technology and or magic, so... Hence the establishment point. They're the big bad guys of the film, right? So we have to establish the team now that they are actually properly a team. So what do we do? Let's focus on Groot 2. 
They call him Groot, by the way, but it has been made very clear that Groot's dead. Groot died in the first film. Groot 2, the entity in this film, is basically Groot's child. No memories, no trade over, just a new Groot. So I, ta I have a tendency to call him Groot 2, but if I mess up, make no mistake, I'm always going to be referring to Groot 2, because there's nothing to talk about with regards to Groot in this film, okay? I have heard some people say that the reason Groot grew into Groot 2 was specifically because they were like, we can't throw away the toy potential of Groot, but he needs to die. It's a big sacrifice for the team. We are Groot is like, is finally, no, 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 no. Make him have a bud so we can have more toys in the future. Okay. <clears throat> so, Groot dances around, and this is all very funny. Um, we also have an acknowledgement that apparently... Oh, God, I almost wanted to call her Morgana. Uh, Gamora is, in fact, a sword person, and not, not a shooty person. Go figure. She just does better with it. She's very trained in it. We also get random exposition from the Sovereign. That's, that's cute. And Nebula's there. Okay, that's interesting. We get remotely controlled ships and Ben Browder. He's there as a cameo, unfortunately, but he's awesome, so it's good to see him. We also interact with a quantum asteroid field. Now, you'll notice I'm just kind of rapid-firing through some of these scenes. It's because this is why this is going to be a short rumination. Oh, don't mistake me. There's stuff to talk about, but com this is a two-hour film, about an hour and a half of which is jokes. And this is the point I made earlier. I was pointing out the jokes, and I actually have several notes about them. But the problem is all I was doing was jotting down such and such, and, oh, God, that was hilarious. And I can't just keep doing that. It's kind of the same problem I had when I was looking at Spaceballs earlier this year. It's like, what do I do? Just point out the jokes? I mean, we can share the jokes. There's some that are particularly funny. My personal favorite joke is, it's not ripe. That, that's my favorite joke in the whole film. What's yours? There we go. We could ask that question. What's, what's the one joke that sold you better than any other in the whole film? I've got another one. Pac-Man. Anyways. <clears throat> And not just for, for nostalgia's sake, it's just, it's funny to me that Ego would make a personification of himself, and Quill would make a personification of Pac-Man. It's just, it just says a lot about their mentalities. Anyways, so fast-forwarding through quite a few scenes, they have a lot of arguments, and they have a lot of angry yelling, and then Danger shows up, and the second, the second Danger shows up, they immediately stop arguing and bickering and go to help and defend each other. It's the first time the family theme of the film is shown. Now I'm going to go ahead and admit something here rather than later. I like a good family theme. I do. I even like the Fast and the Furious series. But I think this film does a better job of it than it thinks it does. And then it feels like it needs to hammer the point in. So it does. Over and over and over and over again. And it, it gets old. It gets to the point where it's like, okay, I get it, film. I get it, family. I get it. It's a damn shame, because the moments that are emotional and impacting and powerful are emotional and impacting and powerful. But, again, we'll get there. But you'll notice I'm just rapid-firing these, because now we talk about um, how Seth Green is Howard the Duck. No, seriously, did you catch that? I hope he voices him in the future if they do anything with him. We see Stallone, a little bit of world-building, the Ravager code, the nature of that. And, of course, the old Ravager team, which comes up in the mid credit scene. Five mid credit scenes, or five post credit scenes, whatever you want to think of. The Sovereign is ridiculous and stupid. Got to make a joke about that. Mantis is... I mean, Drax was the fish-out-of-water humor from the first film. Now Drax is the... I don't know what to call him. He's the... I mean, he's great, don't mistake me. I actually love Drax in this film. He might actually be the most amusing character for me in this film. Although my favorite character would be Rocket, followed very closely by Yondu. But Drax is hilarious. I actually do find it funny. But he's just like... He's the overt, blunt one. Mantis has taken the slot of the fish out of the water who doesn't understand anything. Which will carry forward into Infinity War. <clears throat> so Mantis shows up. They split the party. Rocket is still trying to push everyone away. Kind of a little bit there. Because... Okay, I'm going to go ahead and admit something weird. This film is in many ways Rocket's story. Oh, don't mistake me. There's some good stuff for Quill, but it's mostly Quill coming to a realization. He doesn't actually have a character arc. Rocket, he has something closer to an actual character arc. 
they came for him, even though he pushed them away, even though he was mean, even though he stole batteries he didn't have to. You'll notice the, the movie ends on a shot of Rocket, too, by the way. I also happen to know that when Gunn was sitting down to write this thing, he actually started with the question, what's up with Rocket? And then expanded from there, which is a good way to write, actually. You, you Basically, you pose a question, and then once you answer it, you have to answer like three or four other questions, and then you answer those questions. You just kind of build on that. Anyways, getting off topic. Um, the Ravagers just get crushed by Rocket. Um, and it's actually funny because the Ravagers are so pathetic. It's not until the whistle gets involved, Yandu, with that, that little arrow, when we start to see really just how insanely, well, I'd say powerful, but that's not right the word, how deadly Yandu really is with that thing. In fact, if Nebula hadn't gotten the drop on him, he probably would have just gotten rid of the mutiny right then and there. Thanks, Nebula. Thanks. Appreciate that. There's a... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Taser face? You're... Tell them no. That my name... Was taser face. Okay, okay. Sorry, I said I wouldn't point out every joke. Uh, I do like the design of Ego. Quick aside, by the way. So Gunn was writing the story, and it was so important to him to use Ego and use the planet. And about you know, midway, two-thirds of the way, all of the way through actually writing the script, he realized they didn't actually have the rights to write for Ego. Those are still owned by Fox. Because because films are dumb and stupid and distribution rights are all over the place. You know how this goes. You've heard this story before. I've reported on this a thousand times. So what ended up happening is he basically went to the Fox representatives via the rest of Marvel and Disney, and they were like, so let's make a deal. We need Ego for this film. Now, funnily enough, Fox was actually completely amicable, for once. You know what they said? Sure, but we do want something in exchange. Yeah, what's that? We want to do basically whatever we want to with Negasonic Teenage Warhead. You know, the one in Deadpool. Marvel's response was, sure! <laughs> so there's the trade-off. We get Ego here and Negasonic over there. I'd say that's a good trade. I'd say that's a good trade. Anyways, <clears throat> I think that was actually for Deadpool 2, but I... I I'm not sure of the timeline on this. But Ego, the design of Ego is actually fascinating. Not Kurt Russell, although, man, what a weird twist, right? Like, I don't know if you guys know this. Kurt Russell is, a, is a, by all accounts, a really good father in real life. And he's been married to Goldie Hawn since the 80s. Like, think about that for a second. How many Hollywood stars do you know who's been married successfully for decades? Because I can only think of one, and I just named him. Or them, I guess. Anyways, but no, he's... Him playing Ego, that's playing against type, I'll tell you what, which is, of course, one of the points. Because the film builds up as if so the Sovereign is the bad guy. That's a way... The Sovereign are the bad guy. That just sounds strange. And Ego is, you know, oh, you finally found your father. But anybody who's played D&D &D before, or any video game ever, is, is like, okay, danger senses. You know, we're, with, we're with Gamora on this. There's something wrong with those. We, sorry, I just saw Taser face again. The um, but he, I mentioned the design. Obvious, it's more obvious in some scenes than other. But there's this fractal patterning to everything about the the way his world is designed, which is fascinating. And God, I I just want to praise the art designers who who crafted the architecture and the landscape and every, everything about the planet that is Ego. Absolutely huge, amazing job. Apparently, one of the most complex CGI jobs they've ever done. Which makes sense, it's a planet. I mean, it's only moon-sized, so, you know, whatever. But, yeah, no, I'm just... Whew, awesome stuff, awesome stuff. Nebula... <laughs> Nebula charges in. And we start to see a little bit of her rage at Thanos. And just how much what Thanos did to her really affects her. This is also one of the only times, and indeed the first times, that the film actually starts to get serious. Basically, everything's been a joke up to this point. That's part of why you'll notice I'm halfway through the film now, and I've talked for like ten minutes. I have so little to say because it's just joke, 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 joke. Nebula's thing starts to give us an insight on how much it burns within her, everything that he did to her, and what he believes, excuse me, what she believes Gamora also did to her. And of course, then they immediately go to a joke. I was thinking like a nice necklace, you know? Pretty hat, some 
Anyway, bye. <clears throat> <laughs> Meanwhile, Groot is too ador- I love how all of the pirates all freely admit, No, we can't kill him, he's too adorable to kill! So he'll be- <laughs> He'll be our mascot, mascot, mascot. Poor baby Groot. Or Groot 2. I see, I said, I told you I'd screw up. Craglin ends up saving them. And I, I, what's funny is it appears to be because he had a brain. And I bring that up because I find myself wondering if all of the Ravagers that were killed off, the Loyalists, were the ones who had a brain. Because none of these seem to have any kind of a brain. They might maybe have half of a brain between them. And even that's debatable. There's also apparently a whole lot of them. Yondu just kills them by the dozens plural, and they just keep dying, and it's like, God, how many people are on this ship? It's not even that big of a ship. Okay, whatever, whatever. <sighs> Yondu just really does absolutely clean house, though. And Groot 2 kills the Tormentor. And I guess we're on to page 2 of notes now. We are really rapid-firing through this. Why is it so unhealthy to do multiple jumps? That got me thinking. Now, my first thought is that every time you jump, it does something to you. And you, you basically need a second to dimensionally restabilize. Like, okay. So you need like a, a cool-off period, a break period. And then you do another jump. Okay. Then you do another jump. Okay. And that would make at least a little bit of sense. Um, I imagine 700 jumps in a row, despite other things, probably wouldn't be super nice. I do like, of course, how Yondu's machine does have the location for Ego just plugged in. Why wouldn't it? He's been there many times. <clears throat> so, then the Fast and the Furious theme really starts to get into it, because this, there's this wonderful bit where Quill basically gets into a row with Gamora. And he says, I finally found my family. Don't you understand that? You know what her rejoinder is? I thought you already had. I have talked for most of my life about the concept that family is chosen. And I think that's one of the reasons this film resonates with me so much, because all of the people who consider each other family have no blood relation whatsoever to each other. And in fact, I'm pretty sure 100% of them are actually different species. As in, there's no one species that's represented twice <laughs> amongst the group. Yeah, that's telling. I mentioned the rage. We see a visual indicator of exactly how enraged Nebula is. Not only do we see her, you know, come in, guns blazing, and then trash the ship trying to get to Gamora, but there's a bit where it cuts to her and she's screaming. And then we cut back to Gamora and we cut for a few scenes and like 20, 30 seconds pass. Then we cut back to Nebula who is still screaming. That may not sound as disturbing as, as, as I'm trying to portray it, but I want you to imagine just screaming nonstop for 30 seconds. Don't actually do that right now. I'm not going to do it either. I've, you know, it's it's like 10 at night right now. I'm working late. But, <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that is messed up. There's also, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm trying to, to describe this and I'm failing miserably. To me, this really goes to show how uncaring Thanos really is and helps to show his disconnect from anything approaching love or empathy, with, of course, the one notable exception, which we will discuss uh, quite some time from now. It's a few weeks from now, a few weeks. Can I also just say, Rooker is awesome in this film. Like, really, really awesome. The scene where he just lays into Rocket, I love that. You think I don't know that? You think I don't know what it's like? You just yell at him, you push him away, because even the tiniest bit of love feels horrible in that giant hole in your soul. His parents sold him into slavery when he was a kid. What the hell? What the hell is wrong with this galaxy? Maybe we should let Thanos... Just a thought. I mean, good God. Sorry, but... Ugh. So... The, the film does a great bit of back and forth and back and forth between a lot of things. I just want to focus on ego for this, because this, the film really, really lays it out well. He talks about how eternity got boring, about how he's had nothing, no purpose in his life, no meaning, no, no, no reason to keep going. 
And he reached out and he reached out and he found other life and he found the other life disappointing. He doesn't actually say it, but it's clear that he looks at all other life as not just beneath him, but non-existent. Like, that's not life. Like, that's not even worth it. It's, it's, it's fleas. It's not even fleas. It's just, what is this? This isn't life. I am life. I am the only metric by which life can be measured. So he desires... <laughs> he, I, he desires the same thing that most of the main characters do. To be... <sighs> I, I'm saying this the wrong way. Most of the main characters desire to be a part of something. A part of this family. Rocket, of course, is the most obvious example. But all of them do to some extent or another. Drax has this great line, No, Gamora's right. We will not leave Quill behind. He's family, damn it. We might leave you behind, Nebula. <laughs> Just so you know. No, no, no. She's family, too. We're all family. We've got this. We're going to be a part of this. We're going to be a part of something greater. And our connections and our love and our teamwork is to make us more awesome. You know what Ego thinks? There needs to be more of me. Ego does not want to be a part of anything. Ego wants to be the only thing. Ego wants to be all. I mean, his name's Ego, for God's sakes. And he's also one of the biggest threats to the galaxy, if you think about it, considering his plan here. There's this line he gives, which tells this so much. At long last, I am not alone. He's lived in a galaxy with trillions of life forms, and only now does he legitimately think he's not alone. That is messed up. He doesn't connect with anyone. He's, I'm sorry to parallel this to another character, but he reminds me of Kefka over in Final Fantasy VI, the one entity who is truly, utterly alone in a game all about connections between people. Same parallel. In all of this life, he was never able to connect with any of it. He, he claims he loved Quill's mother, but i got a question for you. All those aliens that came before, what do you want to bet he gave the same speech and the same tour to all of them? Oh, I loved your mother. I finally found the life form, blah, 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 whatever you are, and that was the life form for me. How many times do you think he's given that speech and lied about it? <laughs> Not like he would care, right? It, it, it doesn't mean anything to him to lie about this because he's not lying to something that exists or matters, after all. It's not life. It's, it's an imitation. It's a simulacra. I am life. This isn't life. And that brings me to another interesting question. See, he doesn't get a hold of Quill at the time he was supposed to, which was years ago when Quill was a very young child, right? Remember, Quill in the first film, we see how young he was when Yondu comes to pick him up. But then Yondu finds out what he's been doing with the kids and decides to keep him and raise him as his own, right? Now, <clears throat> that was years ago, like 20-something years ago. And now Quill manifests the power, and you see where I'm going with this already, don't you? It amuses me immensely to think that Ego's impatience with trying to find, to, to, to pull the children in when they're too young, and presuming they would have the celestial gene early, before it had time to develop, is why they didn't. So he painlessly, of course, kills them. Why does he keep around the skeletons? I guess he doesn't care. It's not like it means anything to him. Just, hmm, yeah. So then, <laughs> he's doing all this, and, and Quill's resisting, you'll notice. But what really locks it in, it's probably the best scene in the entire film. Oh, I thought, you know, going back that fourth time, I would never go back. So I did what I had to. I had to go back to the sea, Peter. And so I killed me to put that tumor in her brain. And the camera, the, there's some really excellent camera work in this film, by the way. I just want to point that out. Uh, wild camera choices, especially for the final battle that happens against Ego and the Sovereign. Just, I, like, following someone as they're colliding or doing this weird sh shift or, like, doing the multi-panoramic thing. Just all sorts of cool stuff. Camera zooms in and zooms out on Peter at the same time. And all of the energy is instantly gone from his eyes. And he just looks at him 
And there's only like a couple seconds delay before he pulls out his guns and just starts blasting him. <sighs> that instant, it all just processes. Oh. <laughs> she's just, what do you do when you're facing some kind of evil, maniacal supervillain, right? I mean, this is not exactly the first one he's encountered. So then, of course, Rooker, hey there, jackass! And they start arguing like family does. Hey, God, you have freaking issues. Of course I have issues. That's my freaking father! Sorry, I said I wouldn't point out all the jokes. Final battle. You got any tape? Hey, do you have any tape? No, I don't have any tape. Maybe do you have some tape? This is another one of those curious choices things. Rather than actually show the big climactic battle as they're fighting all this stuff, they just show Groot and Rocket sitting there as, as you know, kind of waiting patiently while Quill's rot flying around, trying to get some tape. Yep. I mentioned some... I didn't actually mention something earlier. Uh, Mantis shares the truth with... Drax. God, I'm tired. And as she, it's interesting though because she shows no hesitance and no reason to do so until she feels what he feels as a father. Did you catch that? It's a really subtle point. But I'm bringing that up because that she, he, he's sitting there and he's thinking of you know his children, his family, his, his wife and she reaches out and touches him. She's just like oh. and seconds later I have to tell you something. I have to tell you something, because now she has something to compare the actions she's always seen Ego do. I mean, if all you've ever known is Ego as father figure, you can kind of see why that would mess you up. It's kind of a echo chamber problem, right? You need external stimuli in order to develop. And all she had was Ego. <sighs> but I point that out, because that is what kind of pushes her to join the team. What is then further contrasting that, and this is a wonderful quote, is, and I quote, what kind of father would I be if I let you make this choice? <sighs> as he's about to die, as, as they're doing the big final thing, there's a really great scene uh, where they see the expansion happening on several planets. And one of them is just some random alien world. I don't even know which one it is. Although we do see the Krygnons or Kranons or whatever. You know, Korg's people. Anyways. <clears throat> but as he's doing it, there's a woman and her child. And she's basically struggling to defend her child with her life. And then it cuts immediately him and he says, What greater meaning can life possibly have to offer? This is the other reason I draw the Kefka parallel. And why Ego is a surprisingly fascinating character despite everything. Because he is so amazingly alone. Because he is so damned full of himself. He is so utterly, repugnantly egotistical to the point where he should die, to put it as simply as possible. So he does. And the whole film builds up to a man laying down his life for his son. And I'll go ahead and admit it. That got tears out of me, even this time through. What then plays is a very long ending. It's like, it's like ten minutes long. It's huge. Um, Nebula looking confused by the hug. Like, she's just standing there with her arms at her side. like. But eventually she does reach up and embrace Gamora. Um, we see Ving, Re Ving Rhames, Michelle Yeo, hope I'm pronouncing that right, and Miley Cyrus for a potential future Ravager thing. Um, they mention Adam. Adam Warlock. Dun, dun, dun. As much as I have little to say about the film, I do want to add one final point. This film, I think, I, I, I said this back when I did the stream discussion on this. I'd have to rewatch it to decide if I liked the first one better or the second. Having now gone through both films with analysis mode on, even though I don't have as much to say about this because of the comedy aspect, I think I do like this one better because of the emotional aspect. Ignoring the obvious family is chosen theme, the fact is Ego himself is the best example of the family theme. Someone who has no idea what that word means. And we then see him in contrast to almost everyone else in the entire film, with the exception of like the Sovereign 
and the, the random ravagers who, they all die, so who cares, right? And I have to admit that touched me. It, it, it was touching. It was, it, was a good, it was a good bit. I'm actually very curious what we're going to see in 3, especially given the, the shake-ups. I'm sorry I don't have much more to say, but I do hope you've enjoyed what we have here, and I'm curious to see, hear your thoughts as always. I'll see you guys next time.